Welcome to today's session titled COVID-19 Vulnerability and Mortality in Nursing Homes, Why Systemic Changes Are Needed Now. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will be collecting these and addressing them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce John Feather, CEO of Grantmakers and Aging and moderator for today's webinar. John? Thank you so much, Elke. And we want to welcome and thank all of you who are joining us today. We have over 750 um, registrants for today's session, so there's clearly a desire for the great information you're going to be hearing uh, in today's session. As was mentioned, I am John Feather, the CEO of Grantmakers in Aging. And we are very pleased to partner with the American Federation for Aging Research on today's webinar, which is the second in a series entitled Aging and COVID-19, What Does Science Actually Tell Us? We also want to thank the Clinician Scientists Transdisciplinary Aging Research Coordinating Center for their promotional partnership of this webinar. How can we better protect loved ones in long-term care from COVID-19? In many states, nursing home patients account for 40% of COVID-19 related deaths. Drawing on frontline experience and published research, today's webinar will examine strategies for lowering illness and death rates among this highly vulnerable population and propose immediate solutions and the need for a national planning task force. We are very pleased today to be joined by three leading uh, geriatricians and gerontologists. Dr. Mark Lax is Director of Geriatrics uh, at the, in, in the New York uh, Presbyterian Healthcare System, Co-Chief of Geriatrics and Palliative Care and a Distinguished Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. And he's also the Board President of the American Federation for Aging Research. Dr. Nathaniel Hubert is Associate Professor of Healthcare Policy and Research and Associate Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. And Dr. Carl Pilmer is the Hazel E. Reed Professor in the Department of Human Development, uh, Professor of Gerontology and Medicine at Weill uh, Cornell Medicine, and Senior Associate Dean for Research and Outreach in the College of Human Ecology at Cornell University. These presenters, in addition to our webinar, they, these presenters have all also recently published a viewpoint article called The Importance of Long-Term Care Populations in Models of COVID-19 in the esteemed Journal of the, Medical, uh, the, the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, and in a related uh, op-ed uh, by Dr. Pillimer and Dr. Lax was published in The Hill, which is, of course, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, newspapers that goes to uh, people who are working on Capitol Hill in Washington. So thank you all for being with us. As was mentioned earlier, you will be able to enter your questions to our panelists at any time by typing them into the question box. Uh, we will be returning to those at the end of the presentations. So at this point, uh, Dr. Lex, I'd like to turn to you uh, to uh, get us going on our presentation this morning. John, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to say a little bit more about our presenters. Today is sort of a, a big red presentation because we are all fortuitously Cornellian. Uh, Nathaniel and I are located at Corn Cornell's Medical School, which is in New York City. Carl is up in Ithaca, the undergraduate campus, as many of you know, is about 250 miles away uh, in more rural New York. And uh, it's relevant to today's presentation. I've been asked to sort of tee this up today as a, a, a geriatrician uh, and as a physician scientist. Uh, my own area of expertise is, has been in elder abuse and neglect, primarily in community settings, but also in nursing homes to, uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, so I'll talk today about um, my clinical experience over the last several months, which has been surreal. Uh, Nathaniel uh, is also a, an esteemed physician here, in addition to being a 
a well-regarded scientist. Uh, he is a hospitalist here at uh, New York Presbyterian Wall Cornell, but also a, a disaster response expert. He did some of the seminal work after 9-11 here in New York City. Uh, he has been part of Governor Cuomo's uh, modeling team, advising the governor, and you're going to be excited to hear what he has to talk about. And Carl uh, is a, a, an esteemed gerontologist, a sociologist by training, who for decades has been interested in long-term care and the long-term care workforce. Uh, so with that predicate, let me just jump into uh, my presentation, if I could have the next slide, please. So um, fortuitously, I was on a sabbatical uh, until March 15th for six months, and I came back to uh, just uh, a completely different world. Uh, I am director of geriatrics for the New York Presbyterian Healthcare System. I'm told it may be the largest in the United States. Um, and on this campus alone, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, we had well over 200 patients on mechanical ventilation at the same time. I mean, just, I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, and and uh, ventilating people in, 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 in operating rooms, in in uh, you know, two to an ICU room uh, in, a, in the emergency department. This, uh, this, this system encompasses several other hospitals up at Columbia Presbyterian, at, uh, in, in, in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn. Uh, and system-wide, there were well over a thousand ventilated patients. Um, I must say, I have never been prouder to work at an institution. Uh, it really rose to the task and really uh, by a hair uh, at least at our campuses, uh, just missed uh, exceeding surge capacity. Uh, and I will say that we were blessed. It's a well-run institution with stable finances, a stable infrastructure, a good balance sheet. We had the best PPE available. Uh, I had to reuse my N95 and we'll do so again today when I see patients. We had some of the best and earliest testing. In fact, we created our own test. Uh, uh, both antibody and PCR uh, for this test. And we had really excellent leadership uh, that communicated well. So, you know, every night at seven o'clock, uh, you may be familiar with this tradition uh, since the beginning of COVID, I would walk out of the hospital and New Yorkers would be at their windows clapping and applauding healthcare workers. Um, but I must say, I felt a little bit like an imposter because something very different was going on in other parts of the city. If I could have the next slide, please. So this really is a tale of two pandemics, uh, and that's largely what you're gonna hear about today. Um, nursing homes throughout the city were struggling. Um, uh, one worker told me that they were, ran out of gowns and they had to use, um, uh, use ponchos. Um, uh, imagine having to come to work in that environment. Masks, very difficult to come by. Uh, nursing homes, uh, a favorite target of the media, now really vilified uh, often unfairly for their inability to find places, uh, you know, to, to, to bring uh, deceased residents to, to mortuaries, having to create their own. Uh, there were certainly bad actors, but um, many good actors, I think, were unfairly targeted in this, in this process. Um, uh, you know, they had, I believe, the absolute worst access to uh, protective equipment and to testing, when in fact they should have had the best access, because this is all about testing, as you'll probably hear from my colleagues. Um, they had a devoted workforce, uh, uh, a well-meaning workforce that largely came from hotspots communities in, in, in Queens, which was overrun in the Bronx. And so uh, these dedicated workers, you know, usually asymptomatic, uh, would come and care for the most vulnerable people and inadvert inadvertently, uh, you know, uh, cause cross-infection and, uh, and, and create, uh, uh, you know, unintentionally problems within the long-term care population because we didn't know what was going on. Um, having said that, uh, while only 1% of people in the United States, all comers, live within a nursing home or a long-term care facility of some type, assisted living, life care community, the majority of deaths nationally, uh, in the first wave at least, were coming from long-term care uh, institutions. In many states, two-thirds of the deaths were coming, uh, but the media got it wrong and the models got it wrong, as you'll hear from Nathaniel. In the media, uh, on CNN and, and other um, news outlets, we would see the 21-year-old the or the 30-year-old or the 40-year-old who perished from this disease. Absolutely horrible uh, and, 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 and heartbreaking. 
Uh, but that was not representative of the larger story, which was mainly older people from long-term care facilities uh, who were effectively uh, uh, dying of COVID because of uh, premorbid conditions, uh, uh, conditions associated with aging. We created a COVID hospice here uh, at my institution. Uh, I served on that hospice. The majority of patients I took care of were from long-term care or were um, long-term care appropriate based on their ability to have resources and live in the community. Um, and the models, which were still proffered widely, failed really to disaggregate long-term care residents from the general community. And that's something that, that Nathaniel and Carl have been especially focused on. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, very quickly, I'm going to outline a series of things that I think we can do now as a physician who's cared for thousands of nursing home residents over a 30-year career. Um, and, and Carl will speak more to some of the, the sort of behavioral and system-wide changes we think are necessary in long-term care. But clearly, um, we need a greater emphasis on infection control in long-term care. It, it's critical. And in fact, uh, there's some recent uh, legislative changes that would, in fact, uh, de-emphasize infection control. This was before the pandemic, but uh, this concerns me greatly. Um, rather than have the worst testing and the worst PPE, long-term care facilities, because of their vulnerable population, should have the best PPE and the best testing, and I mean testing both of uh, residents but also employees. I think if you're going to accept COVID-positive patients, um, they should be cohorted. There should be separate places like we did in my hospital to effectively care for these uh, individuals in a way that's safe, uh, that, that minimizes danger to other residents and, and, and also minimizes danger to staff. And I think that appropriate staffing levels, uh, which have never been talked about in the context of, of, of infection control in nursing homes is, is critical. I mean, when we think about low staffing levels and quality problems in nursing homes, we tend to think about things like bed sores and falling but in fact, um, if uh, staffing is low in a nursing home and appropriately low, and if you have to sing happy birthday to you every time you wash your hands, you're probably familiar with that, how long you're supposed to wash your hands for. Uh, in many facilities, there might not be time to render care uh, while adhering to appropriate infection control practices. I think we need sick time for employees. Uh, we know who works in nursing homes. Uh, uh, it's largely uh, an immigrant community, uh, uh, people of color who come to do God's work at low wages um, and given the choice between not coming to work uh, because of a sniffle or a cough or a cold or a symptom that could be COVID uh, and, 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 and not being able to put food on the table and coming sick, in fact, uh, you know, one should be uh, uh, not coming to work and one should be paid. Um, uh, there have been stories uh, throughout the United States where uh, a few innovative long-term care facilities have paid workers not to go home. I, I read a story about uh, uh, an owner in the Midwest who board a, rented a series of trailers and said to his staff, um, I will pay you. I will pay you over time and a half. I will pay you more than that um, if you stay here and take care of residents and not go back to your community and continue to proffer spread. Sounds like a lot of money. Um, I don't know what the average CNA makes in a nursing home in the United States. It's not very much, but I will tell you that in New York City, we were paying ICU nurses to come from other parts of the country six or $7,000 a week. Uh, and those uh, costs are dwarfed. Um, we also want to minimize turnover in long-term care institutions. You know, when institutions become understaffed, there are registries in which um, employees go from facility to facility. And that's absolutely an infection control nightmare in the setting of a pandemic. And uh, that's a, a policy that needs to be looked at. And uh, we need to limit visitors and test and screen them. Um, I'm quite mindful of the social and, and psychological and emotional problems that creates. Uh, but Carl will talk a little bit about ways to use technology and uh, new systems of long-term care that might permit this in a way that limits the, the psychological burden. Can I have my last slide, please? So look, I'm the president of the American Federation for Aging Research, which, uh, which uh, promulgates science and aging. And, and I just want to say a few things about the unparalleled service and science opportunities here 
uh, whatever kind of funder you are, for those of you who are on the call who are funders, I think we have the ability here to understand the virus from basic biology to public health epidemiology. Unfortunately, nursing homes were a natural experiment. You saw those, 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 those mock-ups of restaurants in China where a spread was delineated. We have uh, large numbers of people in long-term care facilities in, in, in small quarters. I think this, this facilitated spread and there's an opportunity to understand the basic science of the virus. Um, there's an opportunity to use precious resources more wisely and protect hospital systems. So my experience here in New York is that once this gets into a long-term care facility, it is like a hot knife through butter. There's very little you can do. My colleague, Dr. Pilmer, is sitting in rural, uh, rural Tompkins County in upstate New York, and I'm unaware of a case right now, as of now, in a nursing home in, in, in Ithaca. Um, when that happens, and if that happens, a tiny Cayuga Medical Center with its 10 or 20 ICU beds will be instantly overwhelmed. So whether you have a relative in a long-term care facility, care about older adults, as we all do and love, that is something all of us should be concerned about. This is an opportunity to deal with the next uh, wave or new pathogen because nursing homes really are the, the kind of canary in the coal mines because of, of the vulnerability of, of patients. Um, I think we need to seriously redesign long-term care in this country. I won't steal Carl's thunder in that regard. And of course, everybody on this, this call by virtue of your participation in aging uh, is interested in protecting the health, safety, and rights um, of older people. And we could do this, and this was the point of our piece in the Hill, for a fraction, a tiny piece of the stimulus package uh, uh, to effectively uh, really uh, protect not only older people, but the people who care for them and our healthcare systems, which, which at the end of the day were overwhelmed primarily um, by older people who we could have protected. So John, that's the, the, the substance of my presentation. I think we'll turn it over now to Nathaniel without further ado. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I just want to uh, give a brief background on why I'm here uh, and, and what I do. I'm actually the, the co-director with an engineer from Cornell of something called the Cornell Institute for Disease and Disaster Preparedness. Um, we have been working for a couple of decades now on modeling for public health emergency logistics and response, uh, slightly different than um, the main stream of disease modeling. You can see in the picture there, that's, that's a, a picture of two different curves uh, from the 1840s. Uh, and this represents an exponential curve and a logistic curve, that's the flatter one. Um, you know, this, the mathematics behind what we do in modeling is, is not new, but if you could go to the next slide, the, the use of modeling uh, is new. Now, I have to preface this by saying that none of what you'll hear in the next couple of slides, the next couple of minutes represents the uh, official view of any of these entities, most notably the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the National Academies and also none of this is externally funded. If we could go to the next slide. Um, I'll, I'll get to the description of what you see in this picture in just a second. Uh, for now, you can just know that this is on the upper image, a picture of what's happening in the United States as of June 15th, sorry, as of July 15th, um, uh, with the red being cases, and in the lower image, the red in that image being deaths from COVID. These are the outputs of a model that I've created with colleagues in Oxford and also worldwide. It's called the Oxford Cornell COVID, it says 18, but that should say 19, of course, modeling consortium, the Como Collaborative. Um, models like this were only first used in an exercise at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2012. Uh, I know this because I was the first director of the preparedness modeling unit starting in 2008, and we struggled mightily to get the U.S. healthcare establishment to accept the results of modeling. There was a lot of concern that models could be misleading, they could be 
misused and they could just not be helpful in the context of a public health response. All of those concerns are true. However, models can also give us insights, not only into what the future may hold, but more important into what the problem is at hand. And so you can see clearly in that upper image that after an initial spike in cases, which probably was due to the ramp up of testing, that's that first spike on the left hand, there was a steady decline in cases in the United States. If we didn't take a look at what's happening uh, since that red curve started rising, there was a lot of discussion in the United States and abroad about whether this was the natural progression of COVID or whether this was the result of successful, what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. You could at that time make two models, one that showed a rise if you released those uh, repressive public health um, interventions. Uh, and when I say repressive, I mean repressive on the virus, not necessarily on the people. I know that's a political issue. Um, or you could make a model that showed that the virus would, as, as some have said, continue to go away. We now know that the virus is very powerful in terms of its community-based spread. And it did, in fact, rebound, as you can see, when community-based interventions were removed. Um, what's interesting is that the mortality curve is still lagging a little bit, but most of the modeling, as you see here, would suggest that that is going to continue to go up. I've not included actual numbers because this snapshot, even with its confidence bounds and, and shaded in areas, is really like one pixel in a whole TV screen of possible outcomes. And so the point of the model here is to say, this is what we see, and this is where a model suggests that one possible future will go. So that's very powerful, helpful, useful, and scientifically based, but what's missing? What's missing from this model and from virtually all of the models that have been used is a sense of what's called clustering. And we know now, of course, in the United States, that over half of states say that over half of their mortality has resulted from cases in long-term care or associated with long-term care. Our model, the IHME model from University of Washington, the famous Imperial College model, none of these models, because they all use standard differential calculus approaches, none of these models take into account the specific clustering. And that's a failure. And that's a failure actually of the development of the science of modeling. And it's interesting that over the last three years, I've been involved in a National Academies project that has just actually last week released its report about the evidence base for public health preparedness. One of the key messages of that report is that despite all of the monies that have been invested into public health preparedness since 9-11 in the United States, there has been a no consistent scientific plan of attack for understanding outbreaks like this. And B, there's been remarkably little funding for scientific research, for example, to make better models. If you could go to the next slide. So what do we do when we're faced with an outbreak that clearly has features that are not captured by the models? What we do is we make better models. And this is an example from New Jersey where an incredible team of scientists uh, from actually NYU who happen to be um, linked to the New Jersey governor's office by Beth Novak, who's the head of the NYU Gov Lab. And specifically, this is Lakshmi Subramanian and Srikanth Jagabasula, who are in the Courant Institute at NYU and also in the business school, worked hand in hand with the New York the, the New Jersey state government to try to understand what was going on in the long-term care facilities. They created a new survey instrument. They worked very diligently to gather the primary data. And then they had the mathematical ability to make models that could disaggregate the community spread from the long-term care spread. And what you see here is an example of how if you don't do that, you can be misled by an overall picture. 
So the black line up above is combining both community spread and long-term care spread from the 2nd of April to the 4th of May in New Jersey. What you clearly see when you disaggregate that into the red and the greenish blue curves is that the community spread was dropping off dramatically while the long-term care spread was bubbling along at a fairly constant level. Once they had this knowledge by being able to disaggregate the data and make projections along both of these lines, they were able to do very specific interventions to support the nursing homes, including, for example, um, distributing 11 million sets of PPE and getting the National Guard involved in protecting long-term care um, populations. If you could go to the next slide. So what we're left with is the question of what policies work and what policies don't work. And this is from a Canadian report that clearly shows that more intensive policies aimed at protection of long-term care populations, that's over on the right, policy response four, including isolation wards, broad testing, infection control, rapid response teams, in addition to the surge staffing and recruitment and funding for PPE and hazard pay, as Mark had mentioned, leads to demonstrably lower rates, both of death in long-term care and also percentage of long-term care deaths as a percentage of all COVID patients. If you could go to the next slide. So we are at the point now where with a fairly young science, we need to do better in terms of making better models. And the most important thing from the perspective of the conversation today that needs to be done is we need to be able to create much more realistic models of the complex links between long-term care facilities, staff, visitors, and their surrounding communities. And I would add that for COVID, we now know of at least five hotspots. And, and interestingly, they all can begin with P, depending on how you uh, characterize them. And that's pensioners, which would be the British term for long-term care. Prisoners, we know that prison outbreaks have been one of the major seeders of outbreaks in the U.S. Plant workers, for many reasons, including the, uh, the air handling in the types of plants where the outbreaks have occurred, like meatpacking plants, pupils in other educational institutions, and patients for hospital-based uh, outbreaks. As I mentioned, disease modeling is a young science. Response modeling, public health emergency response modeling, is in its infancy. It is barely at the table. And yet, as we saw, the world turned on a dime on the basis of a handful of models. And so the disconnect between the work that's, that needs to be done to make this a better science and the importance and um, impact that it has on the national stage is really dramatic at this point. A famous uh, engineer at Cornell, Jack Muckstadt, has, has famously stated that the purpose of the model is to understand the problem. And I really believe that, and that's why I do what I do. And what we need to focus on now is more translational policy-facing modeling, uh, because this is a critical need not only for COVID, but for everything that lies ahead of us, ranging from uh, public health impact of climate change to other epidemics that, that may arise. And I'll pass it off to Carl now. Well, hi, everyone. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here, and I'm assuming everyone can uh, hear me. Uh, and it's uh, great to be coming after these terrific presentations. I know that we want to have uh, um, enough time for discussion, so I'll probably go a little bit shorter. Uh, if you're as old as I am, you remember a movie called If It's Tuesday, It Must Be Belgium, and it will be a little bit of that kind of a quick tour of the big picture. Um, I do want to say that uh, working with uh, MDs like uh, Nathaniel and Mark, I'm a PhD in sociology, but have an appointment in the Division of Geriatrics, that we have a frequent joke, you know, or frequent, you know, discussion about who the real doctor is. I often joke that I would like a white coat but with my name embroidered on it because there might be a sociological emergency someday. You know, Dr. Pilmer, there's a sociological emergency on floor 12. Well, now we have it. I mean, really from what you've heard, yes, there's a biomedical emergency, but as far as the 
devastation that COVID-19 has caused in nursing homes, uh, we really have a sociological emergency where we need policymakers, we need all the social scientists who study behavior change, uh, we need folks who deal with scientific literacy, we need people who deal with responsive design. We really need all the social and policy scientists in this with us, and I think that's a really important point. Um, I am going to come to the bigger picture a bit, although some of these have been touched on. Uh, this is a little bit closer to what that we should do next as a society in terms of the long-term care world. What the, this has told us, many people have quoted whoever it was who said, don't waste a good pandemic. Um, and in this case, we really have a chance to look at the long-term care system. I do want to say one disclaimer, which might be a little controversial, and if we had more time, we could touch on it. I am not of the camp that is now arguing that this is a uniquely uh, characteristic failing of the American nursing home system, which some advocates and others are saying. And the reason for that is simple. As Nathan said, in most Western nations, 40 to 50% of deaths have occurred in nursing homes and countries whose healthcare systems we greatly admire um, are, are having the same kinds of outbreaks. So it's really not just us. This is a feature of nursing homes and until we can think about them very differently, they will always be almost a Petri dish uh, for the virus. And I will say to Mark, my small unaffected county now does have its first nursing home case. So th this is the way it's trending. Um, in terms of the big picture, here are some ideas. One thing that people may not be aware of, and it may sound at variance with what Nason has said, although it's not, we still strongly believe that this is a tale of two pandemics. But recent research has indicated that a strong predictor of whether there's an outbreak in a nursing home comes from how widespread community spread is. So everything people are doing to slow community spread from masking to social distancing, these two features are closely intertwined and staff go back and forth. So one part of the big picture is, is although they're different dynamics, stopping community spread is key. Going from more of the trees to the forest, efforts to keep people home instead of going into nursing homes, uh, really should be expanded. It's very hard to protect people from anything like this in nursing homes. So if you don't know what the PACE program is, you could quickly search for it. It's a model, um, a support program to keep people in the community. And there are many other community care models. One thing which has occurred over the past three years, and, and again, this is a little controversial, so I'm telling you the side I come down on. There's been some fairly dramatic deregulation over the past three years or proposed changes in regulations that could make the response more difficult. One of those, which seems a little unusual now, is to uh, relax on the requirement that nursing homes have an infection prevention specialist on staff. So I think it's critical, that, and there are others if we have time. Mark touched on this. There, this is showing us how long, and some of us have been saying this for 30 years, a desperate need to reinvent the direct care workforce in the words of a previous program to realize uh, that better jobs mean better care and better care means better jobs. Paying a living wage and benefits so that a person can support a family as a nursing assistant, as a home health aide. Standardizing of the crazy quilt of uh, credentials and training requirements including developing meaningful career pathway programs for nursing assistants. And finally, we have an enormous workforce opportunity here as workers are being made redundant because of artificial intelligence. We could use an army more of certified nursing assistants and community workers in long-term care services and supports. Um, health disparities have shown themselves in nursing homes with broader infections and a greater likelihood to have infections enter and more severe outcomes in nursing homes with higher minority populations. So I think it, that the way the virus has showed us that we need to address um, um, health disparities is also true here. 
we really have to rethink and reimagine how we are designing long-term care. And that's a great location. And for those of you who are funders, you might think about this, to bring together clinical medicine, uh, a responsive design, uh, uh, psychology and sociology, moving away in simple ways, for example, having single rooms in nursing homes rather than having roommates is, a, is one clear option moving towards smaller facilities that are clustered. So we have a huge opportunity to rethink design. And finally, I'm gonna echo Mark's last slide that, and I'll say having worked with foundation funders, this is a little bracketed comment for those of you who are in foundations. We've had wonderful experiences, but one place that foundations sometimes tend to scrimp is they wanna fund the program and not the evaluation. And what we are really lacking throughout the whole long-term care picture are evidence-based programs that have been carefully evaluated because we're dealing with the most vulnerable population. So we really need help from both federal and, and private funders to help us not only create programs, programs, but to really understand if they work, how they work, and for whom. Uh, you know, the more we know about this problem, the more we can stop this devastating outbreak in nursing homes and also be prepared for further outbreaks of other things and improve the quality of care in general. Um, but thanks very much. Well, thank all of you for a really wonderful presentation. That's just a very wide ranging uh, set of issues and but certainly impact a, a population that we're uh, all of us who work in aging are very attuned to and, and are, you know, are worried about. Uh, so at this point, we'll turn to the questions from our audience. Remember that you can still type in your questions uh, in the question box. You just open that and type in your questions, and I will, um, I will uh, read those to our, our panelists, and uh, we'll get started on, on uh, this. Uh, one of the questions that, that came up uh, from several folks, so I'll sort of uh, paraphrase this, there have been places, uh, including in New York City, where long-term care facilities have done remarkably well. They've had very low incidence or no incidence of, of COVID. Uh, what are we doing at this point to find out more systematically what those, uh, what those facilities are doing and disseminating that, uh, that information? And uh, Mark, we can start with you, but any of the panelists can answer that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that is true, and I'm unaware of any systematic effort to categorize that, but that would seem like a, a I mean, a very, very important, uh, a very important activity, which is to see what works and why it worked beyond just have being in a low incidence uh, community, which, you know, as Carl pointed out, is reflected uh, in, in, in nursing home numbers. So um, I don't know if any of the panelists want to comment. Yeah, I can say uh, there, you know, the research is emerging. A lot of it's on these sites that are not yet peer reviewed. There's a debate uh, as to whether quality indicators predict uh, in, um, infections or not. Initial studies found that there was no correlation between say um, a CMS quality rating and the infection getting in. And now there's a little bit of debate on that. So that is, is um, 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 is one key piece. Another one looks like staffing levels. So, uh, you know, having, having better staffing does seem to be correlated with a lot, with a, the less, in fact, less likelihood of the virus coming in. But this is a key priority now is both in assisted living and nursing homes to understand best practices. I will add that as Mark pointed out, there are some communities who have sequestered their staff who've paid them extra to remain on site those seem to have very successfully, both in this country and elsewhere, have been quite successful at avoiding infection with that uh, innovation. Yeah, Carl, if I, John, I just want to chime in on one more point. You know, so one of the, I'm just, this, this is not an opinion, this is the literature. One of the, the, the literature says that one of the major predictors of lower quality on average in long-term care, um, on average, um, is in fact, amazingly, for-profit status measured in any number of ways, bed sores, lawsuits, falling, staff turnover, wages. Um, and so one interesting study would be to look at rates of infection in for-profit versus not-for-profit nursing homes. 
the reason I raise that issue now is, is that I predict, and I know this to be a fact already, that a number of not-for-profit nursing homes are going to go belly up as a result of this. These are, this is a business with very low margins to begin with um, before COVID. Uh, census at facilities now are dropping nationally. So these are facilities that had a razor thin margin when they were full and now have 25% uh, unoccupied rates. And I believe you're going to see a rash of either closures or conversions from um, not-for-profit to for-profit status. Well, thanks for that. And uh, let's let's sort of keep with that general issue. Several questions have asked about the debate that has gone on, uh, not only in the, in the care community, but also in uh, legislative places around the issue of liability for long-term care uh, facilities. And the, the ba how do you, uh, do you have uh, comments about how to maintain a balance between making sure that high standards are in fact um, both expected and also uh, uh, maintained, but also understanding that uh, there may be flexibility needed, including the flexibility not to be sued uh, in the current environment. I'll let any of you jump in on that one. So you might even have a bit of difference between two of your panelists, but Mark, I let me hand that to you first. No, go ahead, Carl, go ahead. I, okay, so I fall along the lines. I mean, I have felt that for, for quite a while, um, lawsuits against nursing homes had a reasonably effective a deterrent effect. I am no longer really of that opinion, or I think they only modestly do. I think that of the fact that this virus has entered outstanding nursing homes as well as poor ones doesn't seem to be clearly correlated with um, other care factors and uh, could lead to such devastation in the industry that, I, I mean, I, I will say this tentatively, I think there are arguments in favor of, of limiting liability specifically around COVID-19 because of its invasiveness all over the world and in countries that have exemplary healthcare systems uh, where people trained for years to become frontline workers. So I'm not, uh, I am inclined to at least considering some kind of protection for nursing homes around liability. Um, but, but that's not super evidence-based, but it, I think it's a reasonable viewpoint. Mark? I generally agree. I think it's gonna, I, I, I don't favor blanket immunity. I think that there, uh, there will be, you know, sort of egregious cases, uh, of, of you know violations of infection control policies where you know uh, you know PPE was not proffered because of uh, 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 because of uh, economic concerns and staff and and residents were put at risk. But uh, I, so I think there uh, there needs to be some protection uh, around litigation, but not not blanket not blanket uh, protections. And I think uh, it needs to be a bit more on a case by case basis. Yeah, I think we, yes, I would agree. I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, Nathaniel, I think that I'll direct the next one to you. Uh, the the model uh, that you're talking about are uh, obviously advanced and, and complex and so forth. Uh, do you feel that we're moving to the place where uh, not only with COVID, but uh, in the next wave of uh, pandemic illnesses, whatever that may be, uh, will be will allow us to really understand them uh, quicker and have specific public policy uh, impacts to uh, for us to, to to know in advance. I guess um, it's a it's a great question. I think the best analogy I can give you is with hurricane forecasting. Uh, you know that our system for understanding uh, where a hurricane will go in the next 24, 48, you know, 96 hours is sitting on the back of 50 years of basic scientific research and funding uh, in this country and, and around the world. You know, the best, mo the best two models, one is from the US, one is from Europe. Europe typically outperforms the US for hurricanes. Um, 
it, you know, these, these are models that, that literally have billions of dollars of scientific brains inside them. Furthermore, there is an entire infrastructure built up to make these complex models rapidly and transparently understandable for uh, people who are intended users of them. And so you have very skilled meteorologists, for example, at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who can briefly scan uh, you know, the every eight or 12 hour outputs of these models and can say, oh yes, the European model is, is going a little bit to the right, but it typically does that under these conditions. I mean, these are people who are so knowledgeable about these models and their environments that in, in which the, the, the quantitative numbers get produced and the, the reason why they do what they do, that they can talk about them as if they were talking about their neighbor down the street. We have zero infrastructure to do that in the United States. In fact, I'm involved now as a, as a representative of the Como Collaborative in um, uh, the very first federally funded through the NIH MIDAS program, that's the Modeling of Infectious Disease Agent Study, um, of a multi-model elicitation. It's being run out of Penn State. Um, it's uh, at this point, uh, I can't reveal any of the details, but I can say that it's a first attempt. So 2012, first appearance of modeling in a CDC exercise. 2020, first funded attempt by the U.S. government to coalesce a bunch of models into a unified picture. Um, so we are, as I said, we are really taking baby steps here in terms of improving our ability. They're necessary steps, but they're baby steps. And what's lacking is a commitment to creating both in this country and globally the type of workforce and opportunities for individuals from very different walks of life. Uh, and what I mean is people coming out of PhD programs in physics and math, but also people who've just taken and completed um, a nursing or a public health degree at a community college. You know, we need all of these people to better understand what models are, how they work and how to use them. And in fact, with my Oxford colleagues, we are now in the process of applying for funding from the UK, uh, from the National Institute for Healthcare Research, for what we uh, are calling a, a, a program for global health leaders in analytics and modeling, so that individuals from around the world, and specifically we're talking about places like Africa, Asia, South America, outside of Europe and the United States, can get the training in analytics and modeling so that they don't need to leave their positions within their ministries of health, but can become really skilled model developers and especially users at the elbow of the policymakers. There's a saying at the CDC that if the modeler is not elbow to elbow with the policymaker, it's unlikely that the model will be useful. And I think that that's really that's really the case. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's an area that I think most of us don't really know very much about. So it, yeah, it'd be great to continue to, to learn more. I think we're gonna have uh, time for one more question. And as you might expect, we've gotten a lot of uh, questions that uh, fall around uh, the current political situation and so forth. So I'm gonna kind of amalgamate those in a, in a different way, which is to say, uh, it, you know, a lot of people feel that any, any kind of change right now is hopeless until uh, we have a different environment. But if, if we, if say in, in uh, a new administration, uh, whoever it is, uh, someone comes to you and says, we, we want you to be part of this national uh, committee that's going to, to work on these problems and solve them. Uh, tell me what your number one priority would be and why. So if that's what the next president of the United States says to you, uh, what would your answer be? And uh, Mark, let's start with you. You know, you're gonna expect a medical answer because I'm a medical doctor, but I'm gonna give a sociologic answer. I believe this is all about uh, the long-term care workforce. 
Um, and, and I, I do believe that uh, uh, we can provide better care for older adults, whether they live in a nursing home, John, or in the community, um, when we create meaningful jobs with a meaningful pathway to the middle class for the people who are doing this work, okay? This is, this will never be automated. There's no app. There's no, there's no piece of technology that's going to replace a living, breathing human being to care for your parents or your loved one. And uh, well, I can, uh, I can talk about vaccines and, uh, and, um, and, and, and drugs and, uh, and testing. Um, it's going to require uh, creating a meaningful change in the long-term care workforce. I may have just stolen Dr. Pillimer's thunder, but we'll see. Well, that's okay. I'm going to go to that. Would have been my first, probably, or, or certainly one of them, but I'll just say two interrelated ones. One is that it is going to sound like uh, the coward's way out, but this issue of long-term care finally needs to move front and center on the policy agenda. So there are those of us who've been saying this through past White House conferences on aging and past political campaigns. It's like people in a nightmare who are yelling and no one can hear them. We're sitting on the edge of an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease, the explosion of the older population with an extraordinarily fragile long-term care system such that people in some counties won't have access to residential long-term care. Whoever, in the next four years, there, need to, there needs to be a national commission, there needs to be a new National Academy of Sciences panel evaluating it, simply putting the issue front and center before we hit a disaster. And part of that has to deal with problems of financing long-term care because most people won't self-insure and it's out of their own means to do so. So I'm going to as Mark switched from medicine, I'm going to switch to economics and say a key thing has to be how we're possibly going to finance the needs of this exploding aging population who's going to have very high rates of dementia. Nathaniel, how about for you? Well, I'll continue with the, the, the switching uh, theme. I'm going to switch to public policy and, and say that I think the most important thing is leadership. You know, the, the U.S. scored highest in the world in pandemic preparedness and response capability last year in a global assessment, uh, very systematic, very carefully met, uh, metricized uh, assessment of, of pandemic preparedness. And, and we, we beat everybody else in the world. What that shows is that without leadership, none of that matters. And so what we need, what I would say to a, a leader is if we want to do this well, we need leadership that is focused on the problem, that has the best science, um, uh, invested in understanding the problem and informing potential response, and has the ability to act on that. Um, you know, one of the things that we lack in this country is an effective public health logistics response capability that is not designed only for immediate uh, short-term emergencies like flooding, et cetera. This is a months-long event, and we need to rethink how we support places like long-term care facilities without needing to call in the National Guard. Um, and so I would say that the most important thing that we need is leadership and a commitment of resources to build over time our ability to do a better job. Well, thank you so much for that, all of you. Uh, we're out of time for our questions, but I want to return to each of you to ask for your final words of wisdom to our audience today. And we, we can go in the same order. So, Mark, let's start with you. Well, um, you heard my comments about, uh, you know, overwhelming healthcare systems. Um, so I don't care if you don't have a parent, a grandparent, a spouse, a relative uh, in, a, in a nursing home or some kind of long-term care facility. Um, sure, we should effectively uh, sort of protect 
this population as a matter of human dignity and of and of and of uh, you know uh, just just general morality. However, failure to do so will overwhelm our healthcare system and effectively uh, uh, lead to economic chaos overwhelm the hospital system so you, you don't you, uh, you know I love older people but you don't have to to be invested uh, in this very very serious problem it, it affects uh, it is more than just a nursing home problem John well, thank you so much uh, Carl I'll stick to one point too because we've made so many others we have learned from this pandemic that we ignore frontline workers in long-term care at our tremendous peril. Part of the situation that we're in is we have people in jobs that require them to work at two or three different locations where they can spread the virus. They go home uh, and cannot sequester because they may live in multi-generational units. They often are immigrants who are living in close quarters. We cannot have a decent, healthy, virus-free long-term care system until we pay a living wage to long-term care workers, provide them with benefits, uh, perhaps provide apprenticeship programs and a whole range of job enhancements that treat these people much more like professionals in difficult and demanding jobs uh, than as a dispensable frontline workers. I think that's the main message I've gotten from this whole experience. Well, thanks. Uh, Nathaniel, you have the final word. I would just say beware of people bearing models. Um, you know, many models are helpful and useful and can, can help you achieve your goal of protecting patients and staff, but, but it's very hard to make models that help more than distract uh, in the heat of an epidemic. Um, so, I would say that you know if there's if there's one thing that is needed, it is uh, collaborative work to build the types of modeling environments and response aids that can help us do things that may seem obvious to some, uh, but uh, clearly in the case of COVID, were not obvious to enough. Thank you so much. I want to thank Drs. Mark Lack, Carl Pillemer, and Nathaniel Hubert for being with us today and for their outstanding contributions. We also want to thank our partner, the American Federation for Aging Research, and our promotional partner, the Clinician Scientist Transdisciplinary Aging Research Coordinating Center. We hope you will join us for the next webinar in this series. Please watch your inbox for announcements of the next date. We will be making this presentation available to anyone who wishes to view it later, including both the slides and the audio, uh, and this is free of charge to you. And please help us distribute this to a larger audience. Please watch for an email to be sent uh, to you within a few days. And finally, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Please stay safe.